I'm very excited to welcome our next guest to the program, although I'm not too excited to, uh, to tee up the topic. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is the, the self-proclaimed caliph of the Islamic State Caliphate. Now, obviously, that uh, caliphate is pretty much down and out, losing most of its territory in Iraq and Syria. The last time he had really appeared in, in a video to rally the troops was in 2014 during a public appearance in Mosul, Iraq. We'd heard various reports, uh, some very credible ones, that he was believed to have been killed in this, that, or the other conflict and strike and so forth. And then you hear, no, no, he's still alive. And it was just all kind of uncertain what the situation was, particularly since we hadn't seen the guy in a while. Well, now he has appeared in video for the first time in five years. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, the extremist group's propaganda arm, released that video yesterday. And he acknowledges that uh, their stronghold in Syria is pretty much defeated, but he vows that there is a long battle ahead. In the video, he also claimed that the Easter Day bombings in Sri Lanka, which killed over 250 people, were part of the revenge that awaits the West. Is this all just hot air? Or is there something to this? Should we be alarmed by this? Does this mean that there could be a resurgence of, of people sort of heeding this call and going alongside Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and other people who are self-proclaimed leaders of the global terrorism movement to help us break down all of this? We're joined now by Dr. Zudi Jasser, who is president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy, author of the book, A Battle for the Soul of Islam. He's a physician and former lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy. A welcome to the program, Zudi. Great to have you here. Oh, it's great to be with you, Anthony. Thanks for having me. Uh, but as I said, I, I'm I'm not excited to talk about the you know the actual topic because one would have preferred to instead get confirmation that uh, Al Baghdadi is in fact deceased. Instead, he is alive and seemingly well. What were your thoughts when when you learned this and and, and saw this news? Well, you know, like you said, I think on the one hand, uh, it's not good news. On the other hand, it also is a significant risk for him to do that. So you may ask, well, why would he do that and take this risk after five years of, of obscurity? And the bottom line is, is they took a major defeat. Uh, President Trump and, and the West uh, language that uh, they have been decimated uh, in many ways was correct from the landmass perspective. But the caliphate is an idea. So basically what he's trying to do is make sure that the idea of the caliphate remains alive. A month ago, al-Qaeda released a new magazine they called Al-Ummah, or Al-Ummah Wahida in Arabic, which means the one Ummah or the one Muslim community. So what was happening, and this was around April 6 or 7, they released a major, major magazine and, and uh, media push out in their own jihadist uh, outlet saying that, you know, they're going to start being becoming again the leaders of the global Islamist community. And I think he had to respond to that. There's a sort of a branding uh, competition happening now for the global jihad. Sri Lanka proved that uh, he still had the capability. So when you look at the strength of ISIS, it's based in finances, it's based in recruitment, and it's based in land. So what they've done is now they've put sort of their flag down uh, in Congo. They attempted attack in Saudi Arabia. They had a successful attack in Afghanistan a month or so ago in Kabul. And now they had this very... Uh, successful attack as far as militant jihadists go in Sri Lanka. So he, he makes this video, starts naming off things happening in the news from Netanyahu election to uh, the changes in Sudan and Algeria. And I think those are also two very significant elements which made him release the videos. He says in the video that uh, he doesn't want them to replace another tyrant with the ones they had before. So he, he lauded them for the revolution, but yet said they're failing again. So just like the Arab Awakening was a huge opportunity for ISIS to then begin to form itself in 2013, I think Algeria and Sudan are also posing an opportunity, and he's trying to do that. And at the end, he talks about avenging the loss in Baruz and, and honoring those, and he pegs off and starts listing all of those that have been a part of his leadership, from the French to the Belgian uh, leader to the uh, Australian one he talks about. So he sort of is reestablishing his global jihad. 
Zudi, you've written about the issue of reform within Islam. Your book, A Battle for the Soul of Islam, uh, deals with these issues broadly. We've got troubling data about the number of Canadians, the number of Americans, Europeans who, who heeded this call. They were excited at the idea of, of having a caliphate. That sort of dream has somewhat crumbled. But when they see this video and when they see al-Baghdadi saying, yeah, we did this Sri Lanka thing, we're going to do more things like that. Watch out. We're going to do other 9-11 type events. Is this something that, that, that tragically might be inspirational to a lot of you know young men hot for jihad right now where does that that struggle for the soul of islam currently sit? that's exactly why he does this is is as twisted as it may seem to normal folks uh, this is inspirational they see him pushing against uh, uh, global establishment uh, uh, governments and uh, uh, he's fearless in doing that so to a identity less a youth who's trying to find something to die for, the global jihad reawakens them. And, you know, from a reform movement, we uh, had coalesced to form the coalition of the Muslim reform movement that includes many reformers across uh, the West. And we've been trying to get the West to wake up to understand the pool that the radicals pull from, which is uh, the nonviolent Islamists and the Muslim Brotherhood legacy groups, but also that we need an offense. And I think this should wake up folks that the whack-a-mole program the Hydra will continue to grow new heads, and uh, uh, defeating them militarily is, is a, a, uh, a generation upon generational movement that will never change. But the only way to change that is to have an offense, and we have not had an offense, which would be the deployment of the ideas of liberty and freedom to begin to extinguish. I mean, if you look at whether it's Al Jazeera from Qatar or Turkey's Erdogan, the Islamist ideology is spreading faster than ever, and that's why – uh, groups that may have had nothing to do with ISIS, like the uh, Tawhidi group in uh, um, in Sri Lanka, came together to join ISIS. These will continue to come together unless we have an offense into identifying with Sri Lankan Muslims why they want to be Sri Lankan and not jihadists, why American Muslims want to be American and not jihadists, and why we'd rather die for America than die for anything else. And currently, a lot of the Muslims getting the the podium, if you will, be it the con new congresswomen or others, uh, they're apologists in many ways. They're, they have a narrative that's not much different from the global uh, non-militant jihad. And we have to begin to have a movement that looks at uh, loving the West, loving freedom, and wanting to push back against theocracy that's trying to fill the gaps that we're seeing in Sudan, Algeria, Syria, and elsewhere. How do we deal with that conversation in, in terms of not so much global geopolitics, but in just North American public discussion? Because you, your, your phrase about loving the West and so forth, I think you saying it as a, as a Muslim man, people can, can see it for exactly what you're saying. But, you know, I go ahead and I say that uh, on the news and, and they try and wrap it into some, you know, oh, it's a white supremacist ideology. And they bandy about all these, these terms to kind of discredit the idea. Meanwhile, we do have a plague of, unfortunately, hundreds of Canadian young men and women who, who have gone abroad to try and fight with ISIS and so forth. So the basic idea of, of I think, promoting those those liberal democracy values you speak of, I, I find even that it can be challenging this day and age. Oh, it sure is. And and the bottom line is, is we've had this sort of bigotry of low expectations when we address Muslim issues. You know, now on the cover of Sports Illustrated, you have a hijabi lady who's wearing a, a skin-tight bodysuit, and somehow that's supposed to be progress, when in fact... It, it's really, you see the left who, who claims to be about feminism, who claims to be about gay rights, and all these issues that should be front and center when dealing with the Muslim community, they're not. And they use terms like Islamophobia when, the you know, that term is used to suppress criticism of Islam. So there are many on the left that share our values in the Muslim reform movement, which is anti-theocratic, and yet they're they're using us as a minority political identity group rather than truly facing the ideology of Islamists, which, uh, you know, uh, how did all of a sudden hijabis, for example, which I have many uh, women in my family that wear the hijab, but yet they're not looking to become poster people of Muslim communities. We're a very diverse community. So if the Western media, be it in Canada or the U.S., truly believes in diversity, they need to have some ideological diversity. I mean, the the popularization of folks like Amr Khadr in Canada and being given $10 million and sort of becoming a celebrity when, in fact, he killed Americans, he killed, uh, committed acts of terror. And, and almost from just an identity point, uh, the apologetics gives this 
uh, a bigotry of low expectations. And we need to begin to engage issues on the front lines, women's rights and other things that we can come together on. And the Islamists will then truly be marginalized like they should be. Very powerful words from our guest, Dr. Zudi Jasser. Before I let you go, Zudi, are you optimistic that we are heading in this right direction that, that you, you chart the path for, or are we regressing? I have to tell you, as an activist, I've been doing this not only after 9-11, but since I was young, working against the Brotherhood. And we formed our organization in 2003 with a mission to separate mosque and state. And people said, well, why do you do that? Just fight terrorism. I said, well, terrorism is a symptom. We have to defeat political Islam through the advancement of liberty. Then comes ISIS, and they say, oh, that's why you're against the Islamic State. I said, well, maybe, but most Islamic governments are theocracies. That's what we're fighting. So I have to tell you now, as people see more Islamists getting uh, front and center and media attention, I think it's a good thing because now, finally, people are understanding the world I live in and the world reformers live in, and it's becoming more prime-time conversation, which I think is only success. And I tell the radicals and I tell the Islamists, thank you for making yourself visible so that America and Canada can see exactly how incompatible your ideas are with Western civilization. Dr. Zudi Jasser, former lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy, president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thanks, Anthony. Appreciate it.